Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Deanna Barrett from the Indiana Department of Workforce Development. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there, and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Deanna Barrett, the data officer at the Indiana Department of Workforce Development. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about it. Deanna, hello and welcome. Hello and thank you. Uh, so excited that you uh, are able to come on to the podcast and uh, join us. I'm so excited to hear more about um, what you do and, and your background and how you got there. Um, so tell me, let's start with where you are now. You're the data officer for the Indiana Department of Workforce Development. So what is the Indiana Department of Workforce Development? What's, what's the purpose of the organization? Yeah, we are a fairly large state government agency, and we are most known for the work in the unemployment sphere, uh, where we provide an unemployment insurance to people who have lost their jobs uh, to no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. That's probably what we're most known for, but we do a lot also on the business development side where we talk to employers um, to first understand what they're lacking um, in terms of skilled employees, help them get qualified workforce, um, either by finding existing available workforce for them or um, helping them with training grants to create that qualified workforce. So we also, we provide or help fund various education programs ranging from high school diplomas to industry recognized certificates to post-secondary education. And of course, along the way, we collect a lot of data on Indiana's workforce. So um, anything from their occupations, the industries they work in, their previous education, where they live, where they work, uh, is it full-time, is it part-time? their current salary, um, if they had a gap in employment, um, and many, many more data pieces that we then turn into information for our constituents, uh, the researchers, um, and partner state and federal agencies. Oh, very cool. That's That sounds like very rewarding uh, purpose. It is. Public service uh, is uh, hard, but like you said, it is very rewarding. Uh, so as a data officer, what's your typical work week look like? How do you work with data? My typical work week is busy, and I, I want to draw a line between busy and stressful uh, because it is keeping me engaged uh, full time. I'm at my desk, but it's not causing me stress because I truly enjoy working with data and creating processes, documenting them, um, and working with people to adapt to these processes and uh, make those small incremental changes. Uh, so I am the first ever data officer for my agency. So there wasn't a roadmap I was able to take over and bring to the next stage. So a lot of my work at the moment uh, is divided between being a strategist and a visionary uh, where I create the direction for data governing and management uh, for the entire agency. Uh, but right now, Shannon, you're talking to half of my entire office. So I have only one more team member. 
that is dedicated to data governance full time. Uh, so I also get to do a lot of uh, busy work from talking to our data requesters, reviewing data dictionaries that we have. Um, I also draft data sharing agreements um, and I actually map out new processes step by step. Um, and then thinking, okay, how are we going to deliver this change to the entire agency, uh, including those people that are really valuable to us, but who are more ready to retire than to revamp the process they've been doing um, in a certain way, and that has been working okay. Uh, so it is dynamic, um, and it is challenging just enough to keep me going without the stress. Uh, I love that distinction that busy does not mean stress. I, I think that's very important uh, and something we haven't touched on in this podcast, but it's very true, right? Especially if you love what you do and there's such a reward at the end in helping people out. Absolutely. It's not like that every day. There are days that are very stressful, uh, but when I look at it overall, it really is, um, I think I really found my niche where I can you know, use all my previous experiences and and continue to grow. That's very nice. And so, you know, and let me ask too, you know, what made the uh, Indiana Department of Workforce Development decide to have a data office and a data officer? And congratulations on being the first in that role. <laughs> That's amazing. So how, what, how did that decision come about? It really came out of a pure need. So we did not have um, any really well-documented processes and we hold data that is so valuable to so many people. So everybody wants to know uh, how much their people that went through their programs or people they helped through, through their work, how much they're making, if they were able to get a wage increase, if they were able to get a promotion. So mm -hmm. we hold all that data, but uh, the process before was, okay, I know this person that works for DWD, let me email her and see like if she can get me together with somebody who can provide the data. So it took a lot of time for you know the person to find internally, who is the database administrator, the administrator for this particular data uh, and then connecting with the legal team. Okay, is this something that we can share? Because we operate on the very st uh, strict federal rules that say these entities can receive the data at the level of granularity they are requesting it and the purpose is fine, but these entities cannot and the purpose is not, not allowable. So it took a lot of time. The process was not mapped out. And I was at that time working um, under the research and analysis team. And I have a law degree from Croatia. So I was, because I was in data and I was in law, I was kind of uh, the point person where a lot of our requesters went to, and then I would coordinate things internally. And we then realized, okay, we can really benefit from this process called data governance. And we started creating a job description. And mm -hmm. while I was really happy with my research and analysis position, where I was able to work directly with data, uh, make some impact, um, when the job description for data officer was created, I was like, I want to go after this because this is really, this is exciting. This is new to me and I can use all my previous knowledge and experience and uh, hopefully make a change. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's so, that's that's great. I love that you just went for it and, and, and didn't question it. Uh, and you, you, it brings us, that's a perfect segue too, to talk about, you know, how did you get there? What is your experience? You mentioned that uh, you got your law degree in Croatia. And I know that you were are from Croatia, just from previous conversations that you and I have had. Um, so tell me, you know, when you were very young, uh, you know, say six years old, did you say to yourself, I'm going to go move to the States and become a data officer in this state agency. 
<laughs> or what and um, but uh, what was the dream even before you got to law school what was what was the dream yeah well i can tell you absolutely not i had never even dreamed of being a data officer mm -hmm. until about really 6 years ago um i'm sure when i was 6 7 years old data officers existed uh, when I was growing up, but we may not have called them data officers at that time. Um, and I didn't really know I would, um, it would really end up being such a good fit for me. So when I was very little, I actually wanted to be a flight attendant uh, mm -hmm. because my dad spent his entire career in the aviation industry mm -hmm. and he would take me on flights with him. So I would walk up and down the plane pretending to serve imaginary people um and i still love flying but as a passenger these days more than anything um and then i think you know i i kind of um it was an unusual path i went from uh really wanting to be in the aviation um but when i was about 10 i went to istria which is a gorgeous peninsula in croatia um and Istria is bilingual. It's very close to Italy. So most people speak Italian. And I heard Italian. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm learning this beautiful, charming language, and I'm going to be a language interpreter. And at, at that point, I was already taking um, English, um, Russian, German. Um, wow. I later on picked up French and sign language as well. And I was really serious in making talking my career. Um, and I still have the passion for learning languages, uh, but when I was about 12, I discovered I really like finding out facts. I couldn't pinpoint it at that time, mm -hmm. but I would like in situations where, you know, my friends had disagreements about who had the ball last and if it hit outside or inside the field lines. Um, I would always encourage people to, you know, hear both sides, like what you saw, what you think you saw, and then make some sort of a compromise. Uh, but also, you know, at other times I would be so passionate about something that I would fight for it uh, fiercely. And mm -hmm. then I thought, okay, I really want to be a lawyer. So I ended up getting a law degree and learning about, you know, collecting the data how you flush out facts from the data um, and how you create information. And I really loved that process and still love it to this day. Oh, that's amazing. So how many languages do you speak? Well, I would say I, I speak fluently just English, but um, I just recently went to Paris and I was able to order everything I thought I ordered. Uh, we got everything on the table. It was correct. And um, so I, I think, you know, I can I can still remember languages are, if you don't speak them for a long time, they kind of go away. Uh, but the memory just came back. So um, I do speak some French, some Italian, some Spanish, just because it's a similar um, language group and also, I have to say Serbian and Bosnian, but that is the difference between Croatian, Serbian, and Bosnian is like British English and American English, although they are considered separate languages. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, okay, so then you, um, so you went into university though, and, and uh, so how, tell me about that and what you started studying because, and then you get a law degree. Yes, I was um, I was always driven to do multiple things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So law school in Croatia is specific. Uh, it is five years. We started right after high school. Mm -hmm. And when I started law school, it allowed some classes were mandatory. You had to go to class. Some mm -hmm. were not mandatory. And you would just then take the exam at the end of the academic year. So that allowed me some time to explore um, what I want to do while I'm not studying. So I got involved with um, an amazing education and soft skill building nonprofit. And at that time we were funded through a lot of grants. So in the process of writing those grants, uh, we had to look for data to support our proposals. 
And then after we got the grant and we implemented the project, we had to collect data on our participants. So it was both qualitative and quantitative data. And um, I was in charge of implementing the projects, but also drafting those data collection methods um, and then analyzing the data in the end. So in that process, I learned how I really enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, so um, I ended up spending about 10 years working for the nonprofit. And while I was still there, I thought, okay, like this data collection, may it may be really a good time for me to get some official training in research. So I decided to pursue a doctorate. Um, yeah. Long story short, I was looking for somewhere you know, near where I live, where I could still keep my job and have my family, and my friends near, but go and get this doctorate somewhere. But it happened that I, I got a scholarship at Indiana University. And mm. I decided at that time, okay, I'm going to uproot my life for a couple of years and do um, the PhD and get back. But life ha had different plans. So I ended up staying in Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, I loved research. I still love law. So when I got the position with the Department of Workforce Development um, with Research and Analysis Division, uh, that allowed me to do a little bit of both. So mm -hmm. I was involved in data sharing and uh, collaborating with the legal team and collaborating with the database administrators. So it was really, really a good fit. It was rewarding, but um, because we have so much data, we have so many databases, we have so many different data management practices that that's when we started talking about, okay, maybe you know data governance can help us uh, get to the next level and be better servants uh, to the public that we are serving. So that's, that's how I ended up in the data officer role that really allows me to combine um, all of my passions. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Uh, I love that. I love that it's uh, a story of passion. And I love that you um, have these super brave moments of m moving to a new country and, you know, a, a totally, as you say, uprooting your life. And you had with it, when you originally wanted to stay close to family, and that's hard thing and scary thing and, and a brave thing to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, that you just went after this job. I just, I think those are, are two great things. Um, so what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Well, I, I think it would have to be um, your attitude really matters. You don't come to any job knowing it all, um, understanding the culture you're about to enter, um, and even to an extent, what exactly is expected of you at the job. So your attitude really matters. Be open to the unknown um, and we can learn together and we can grow together and we can make impact together. And in the end, it really is that people matter the most. Mm -hmm. um, so if I look back in my career, one of my most impactful supervisors when I was about 20 years old um, he had always let me do what I thought was right yeah so he just asked me like okay do you think this is the best way to go about the matter and then he would let me do it no matter how far off I was from a good solution so yeah. after that he would always make me reflect on what happened and what I could have done better so that process made me not afraid of trying different things and new things as long as I give myself the time to reflect and, and learn from them. Oh, I love that so much. It's so hard uh, as a manager to do that, you know, when you see a mistake that's going to be made, but so important yeah. to let people make mistakes so they can learn. And another point that 
um, has never, I don't think we've touched on in this podcast before, you mentioned going in and um, being open to understanding the culture. And I think, especially as Americans, we tend to think that I see, I've seen this a lot where people will transition between companies and expect the company culture to be the same as it was in this other company. And it's not. Each company has its own culture. Um, and it, traveling, you know, I think helps to do that to, to, you know, just not, it's not just about, you know, demographic culture, but corporate culture as well. So that's really good uh, advice and really interesting. Um, do you think that, you know, being from a different country has, has helped you to, to keep that open mind? I think it absolutely did because I really had to first observe because I, Croatian culture is very different. We are loud, we are very open. So if, you know, we think an idea is not good, a lot of people will tell you that idea is stupid. So we did not really, we don't have the same filters as Americans do. So I yeah. really had, I had traveled to the States about six times before I actually ended up living here, but I was here as, as a tourist. Yeah. But I always try to observe, okay, what's happening, like how people are reacting to each other's words, how people are reacting to what what pe other people are doing. Uh, and that really helped me um, to understand, okay, you know, you have to leave your culture, whether that's, you know, like your culture where you grew, grew up or mm -hmm. the culture from a previous company, you have to leave those expectations at the door and take some time to observe and learn what the norm is in this new place. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So tell me, I mean, now that you've worked with data so uh, long and, and it's now your primary focus, what is your definition of data? That is a really tough question. And I can probably tell you better what data means to me. So data can be two opposite sides of the spectrum. So it's either the essence or it's nothing. Uh, not essence in the sense it's the, the most important thing in the world, uh, but our world is created and um, gets improved based on data. But if we don't do anything with the data and if we don't learn from it, then we get to that opposite side of the spectrum where data is just sitting there alone. So I would maybe describe, when I was talking to my daughter the other day, I, I would maybe describe data as musical notes that, you know, we, we put them in the hands of the most creative composers and then they pass it on to the best instrumentalists and then they pass it on to the best storyteller singers and the best conductors. And then the audience gets to enjoy it, but they get to enjoy it by bringing their own experiences into it. So as much as we want data to be objective, we have to acknowledge it is subjective too. And, and that's what makes it beautiful. Indeed. Um um, I, I, I agree. <laughs> it, data can can uh, paint a picture, <laughs> yeah. and it can be beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it's, so, it's it's totally nerdy to say, but seriously, Shannon, like it's uh, it's been such a rewarding experience. Right, right. Well, I, I you know you're talking to a fellow nerd here, so you know what can I. <laughs> Can I say, I, I currently have a mug that says, ooh, this requires a spreadsheet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand. So, so tell me, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? I so my agency does um, some projections. So we have um, actually a system where we try to see which roles, which positions will be 
in high demand, which will be high paid. So I can see the importance of uh, data management jobs, um, the importance growing, but I am not sure actually about the number of jobs growing. So I see us becoming more efficient with new technologies and solutions that the AI may bring us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I should clarify uh, uh, the careful and ethical creation and use of AI. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, the importance of data related jobs will grow, but the AI will also uh, free us to pursue other avenues that we can combine with that a data management job. So I understand mm -hmm. it is still scary to think about it, but it's also very exciting. So mm -hmm. my daughter's education and career path and how she does her job, and she's now seven years old, um, <laughs> that it will look very different from mine. And I'm just curious to see how her generation thrives from the data that we turn into information today. Oh my goodness, indeed. And I love that you bring up the the ethical implications implications of AI because yeah, it's it's gonna take some work there. <laughs> and making yeah. sure we get good data into those in, into uh, those initiatives. Yeah. But um, so what advice then would you give to people get looking to get into a career in data management? I would say personally, do not get discouraged if your career or education path thus far hasn't been traditional or typical for what you think a data manager's or a data officer's path should be. So if your path isn't typical, don't think of a career in data as taking a risk, but think of it as taking the opportunity and just see what comes out of it and who you may inspire to do the same along the way. Oh, such good advice. Cause, and, and that's been kind of the point of this podcast is there's, there is no one typical way. I don't think, especially for, you know, uh, current roles, uh, as you say, they're new, your job is new. Uh, a lot of these jobs are new and yet defined. There's no degree in data management um, as of yet. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> so, oh, I love that advice. Well, Deanna, this has been such a pleasure to chat with you uh, and to hear you, more of your story. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's such interesting work that you do. And I love that it's combined um, with employment opportunities and really helping to people to to find work. So, um, so thank you very much for what you do. And uh, anything else that you want to add? Any, um, any information that people, you think that people should have in, when they're looking to get into a career or reaching out? No, just, just there there and see what what you may land on you may figure out this is not for me it's too much time it's too much effort it is too geeky um but just give it a try if you're curious all it takes is curiosity mm, very good point and we do talk about curiosity a lot in this because it's very important <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Deanna, thank you so much for taking the time. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash uh, subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.